All right, in part two of Mobilizing for Total War, we'll talk about how the government uh, faced with the total war had to organize civilian labor, how they had to organize military labor, and how they paid for all this. The government worried about uh, labor, uh, labor's cooperativeness as much as industry did. The war strengthened the market power of workers because there were all these orders from Europe, and uh, my, and yet immigration was plummeting from Europe because of the war. Uh, so the U.S. also lost uh, 3 million potential immigrant workers it would have had during these years and another 5 million uh, to military service. So it opened opportunities for other people. Uh, 500,000 southern blacks migrated north to work in factories. We've already talked about this is the beginning of the Great Migration. Um, another 500,000 white southerners also did. Hundreds of thousands of Mexicans fled the, the, the Mexican Revolution, which was occurring at this time, a lot more about that later, uh, for agricultural, mining, and railroad jobs uh, in the Southwest. Uh, approximately 40,000 northern women uh, also took jobs that would normally be reserved for men, like streetcar workers, uh, metal workers. Uh, female clerical workers uh, also doubled uh, from 1910 to 1920, uh, many with these vast government war bureaucracies. Uh, one million women total worked in war-related industry. Now, all of these new workers helped but did not eliminate the labor shortage. Uh, strikes and job hopping were more prevalent. Union membership almost doubled. Uh, wages uh, increased 137% from 1915 to 1920. And worker hours uh, decreased from an average of 55 hours in 1915 to 51 hours in 1920. Why were things better for workers? Well, because they were in demand. Uh, the, the, the price for labor went up because the, the, the demand for it was high and the supply was low. Also, uh, Wilson's um, uh, democratic ideals uh, appealed to workers. They said, well, how about some industrial democracy? Uh, we, we want our fair share. And to a large degree, they got it during the war. Wilson's willingness to include uh, labor in his progressive coalition reflected his awareness of labor market realities. Uh, in 1917, he was the first president to actually address a meeting of the uh, AFL, the American Federation of Labor. He gave credibility uh, to the National War Labor Board, uh, the uh, war bureaucracy um, devoted to making sure labor and industry were cooperative, uh, by appointing uh, William Howard Taft, uh, former president, as one of its co-chairmen. Uh, the National War Labor Board uh, brought together labor, industry, uh, and the public to resolve uh, labor disputes. Um, the presence of uh, AFL President Samuel Gompers on the board gave unions a voice in government affairs. That was unprecedented. Labor was beginning to get more respect. Uh, in Britain, by the way, during the war, the Labor Party um, came into power for the first time. Like the War Industries Board, the National War Labor Board lacked statutory power, but still managed to pressure manufacturing to improve wages and hours, reducing wage discrimination, and allowing unions to uh, operate, all in the name of getting production up to support the war. Now let's address military labor. Uh, government uh, did not hesitate to use its full power to raise an army. Uh, the Wilson administration rejected the idea of a volunteer, uh, volunteer army in favor of conscription. Uh, the Selective Service Act was passed in May of 1917 uh, and authorized this, um, this recruiting, uh, this um, draft. By war's end, 24 million men, 18 and over, were registered. Three million of those were drafted, and another two million volunteered. Uh, few men resisted, uh, even recent immigrants. In fact, 18% of this army uh, was composed of people that were born outside the United States, reflecting the immigrant nature of the U.S. during the Gilded Age. Now, uh, this 5 million man army included 400,000 African Americans. It would have been more uh, had Southern draft boards permitted them. Uh, the, the army had enough trouble training um, 
this army to fight uh, didn't attempt to train away their prejudices. Segregation was maintained, and black units were barred from combat. This was particularly galling, as we've discussed in the past, given their performance in previous wars, uh, especially under uh, General John Pershing, who was known as Black Jack Pershing because of his reliance on African-American troops. Now, for a time, uh, the military justified uh, discrimination by IQ test given to two million soldiers. This is the first time. I IQ tests were a relatively new thing. Uh, first time they were used by an army, and these tests proved, quote-unquote, that native-born Americans and immigrants from Anglo countries were smarter. Uh, most sensational uh, revelation was that more than half the soldiers serving, black and white, were classified as, quote, morons, unquote. This was the official term of the day, which means they failed to reach the mental age of 13. Half the army were morons. Uh, so in 1919, the IQ testing program was uh, quietly discontinued. So the United States um, uh, increased the Army from 100,000 to 5 million uh, in little over a year. Uh, not one soldier died in crossing the Atlantic. In combat, uh, these U.S. soldiers, these morons, uh, were known, uh, were, did well. They were known particularly for their shooting um, Sergeant Alvin York of Tennessee was uh, the great hero of World War I. Uh, he captured 35 machine guns, took 132 prisoners, and killed 17 Germans with 17 bullets. Uh, he was an experienced turkey hunter, and his, his comment about it, self-deprecating, was, of course, it weren't no trouble know-how for me to hit them big army targets. They were so much bigger than turkey heads. One of the most decorated uh, AEF units was the uh, New York 369th Regiment, uh, uh, called the Harlem Hellfighters. Uh, Pershing was under pressure uh, from civil rights groups like the NAACP to allow blacks to fight. Uh, he couldn't, so he loaned the 369th to the French, uh, and the entire unit won the uh, Croix de Guerre. Government acquired huge debts. Um, uh, it sharply increased taxes, uh, very high. The, the richest paid 67% uh, of their income and 25% inheritance tax. Uh, corporations were hit with something called excess profit, uh, profits tax. This was meant to ensure that all Americans made sacrifices and that special interests did not escape. This has been a hallmark of American wars since. Uh, the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan this last decade were controversial because tax is the only time we fought wars and not raised taxes. In fact, we cut them. Um, but taxes only produced one-third of the $33 billion cost of the war, so we had to borrow the rest. We borrowed it from Americans. We sold liberty bonds. 30-year bonds paid 3.5% interest, and they sold quickly with uh, uh, Treasury Secretary McAdoo's sale, sales pitch. He said, it's your patriotic duty, and it's a good investment. Uh, McAdoo recruited Boy Scouts. He staged giant rallies with movie stars, and Americans loyally bought up um, these bonds. 